So this week we're looking at how to assess students' achievement in technologies education. So we're going to look at a range of different aspects of assessment. Firstly, the achievement standards as they're described in the Australian curriculum. The work samples that provide an approach to assessing students' uh, achievement standards. The concept of design briefs, um, how to assess the general capabilities and the different types of assessment, particularly formative assessment that are available to us to gain a better understanding of how students are going in their learning of technologies education. So first off, the concept of assessment. Essentially, it's gathering evidence to make judgments about students learning. So we employ a whole range of techniques to understand students learning. And the purpose of, of assessment should generally be to help us better understand what students know and how we can then help them know more or progress in their learning journeys. Now, of course, there are other purposes that assessment is applied to around ranking students and restricting access to getting into university and things like that. But for educators, the fundamental purpose is around improving student learning. So it's recommended that you have two focus aspects around the content descriptors in the Australian curriculum. Um, and by limiting yourself to just one or two content descriptors, each assessment task or activity, you give more opportunities for students to have multiple chances of meeting those content descriptors. If you're trying to meet all the content descriptors in every assessment task, um, then students are only going to have one chance simply because there's so much you're trying to assess each time. So you don't need to assess everything every time. Be selective in your assessment uh, processes and be focused. Drill down to really try to understand that students are understanding what um, they're learning rather than having just a superficial overview of all the different elements that need to be assessed over each two year band. So part of this process um, is done in the initial planning and programming stages when you plan out what you're going to teach for the year or for the unit. And it provides you um, a guidance in where you want to see students progress, what the expectations are at the end of each unit or at the end of each two year band what students should be able to demonstrate and have learnt during that process. Now, part of this is identifying the current levels of achievement that the students are at. Um, one of the challenges of modern education is that students progress even though they may not necessarily have achieved all of the pre, all of the learning expected of them at lower levels. So unfortunately, you do need to make some um, gauging of students' prior knowledge or knowledge they're coming into your your class or into your subject with. Um, so that's another aspect of assessment to diagnostically understand where students are at. And that then helps provide you with guidance in how to support students in coming back up to speed. Um, and it also allows you to then build upon their current knowledge. It may be that in their earlier years, say in year three or year four, they exceeded what the expectations were for what they were learning. So having that understanding then let you build upon what they currently can do rather than just blindly repeating and having your students become bored by you going back over material that they've already mastered. 
Now, at the end of a teaching period, you're going to have to make some more formalized judgments. We call this summative assessment. Um, and normally it's to report back to parents in primary schools. Um, sometimes they're useful for selective entry into um, certain schools. Uh, say if it's a competitive entry process to get into a high school or even some you know, more advanced primary schools, there could be some uh, more formal assessment requirements for that. But in the main, it's to inform parents on how students are progressing and to inform students. And we make what is called on balance judgments. So we look at the evidence of students learning and it's not going to be uniform. They're not going to achieve A's in everything or F's in everything, hopefully. Um, so there's going to be some uh, trade-offs that you need to consider. So they may have been really great at coding, but really hopeless at documenting their planning. And so you need to make an, an on-balance judgment about where students are placed, because we generally assess on a relatively um, narrow scale, A to E. Um, We've tried to provide more evidence to parents on the detail of what they've learnt, even down to all of the different content descriptors, but the parents rebelled against that. It was just too much detail for them to understand, and rightly so. They're not educators. They don't have an in-depth understanding of all of these um, content descriptors, and particularly when you start looking at it across seven subjects and things of that nature. So. Um, it's been very clear that parents just want a simple, um, on-balance judgment about how students are progressing on an A to E scale, and that's what they're provided twice a year, along with report, reporting comments, which elaborate on the specifics of an individual's student's um, progress. So in order to make these judgments, we need to collect evidence. You can't make judgments just on gut feelings. Even though your gut feelings will probably be correct 99% of the time, um, teachers get a very good understanding of how students are progressing, even without evidence or without explicit evidence. You pick up a lot of evidence as you just observe students. But in order to make a formal assessment, you do have to be able to point to some evidence. And some parents and indeed some students will ask for that evidence um, at your parent-teacher interviews and things of that nature. So you have to have evidence to support your formal judgments. And that's something you'll do through a range of different assessment processes. But there's quite a lot of variety in what can be done around that. So one of the big aspects is we need to understand whether or not a student is achieving below expectations, or indeed whether or not they're, they're achieving above expectations. Um, and this will then help you decide in where you need to focus your attention in either individual learning or group learning. Um, if you've got a whole lot of students achieving below expectations around a particular concept, then obviously you'll need to put more effort into addressing that concept, either for that class or in future years. But likewise, if you've got a whole lot of students that are mastering something really quickly, that also tells you that you may be able to then extend that aspect of what you're teaching and go into more and more complex aspects. Um, so it's that additional support and specific needs around individualizing um, students' learning, what we also call differentiation, um, is an important aspect of assessment. So, to assist with all that, we have the achievement standards. Now, in technologies education, we have three sets of achievement standards, or well, at least, and it's also the general capabilities and, and so forth. But we have the achievement standards for the learning area as a whole. What students will um, achieve in studying technologies, both digital technologies and designer technologies. And while both of those subjects um, incorporate aspects of the overall achievement standards, you still need, unfortunately, have to look at um, the overall achievement standards as well as the individual subject achievement standards. Um, the sum is not necessarily the entirety of the parts. Um, so looking at the overall achievement standards, 
we see that in PrEP, students are focused on identifying familiar products and services and environments and so forth, but using those things for a purpose. Going into year, um, by the end of year two, students should be able to describe the purpose of these familiar products, services and environments. Years four, they need to describe how people design these products, services and environments. And by the end of year six, they need to explain how people design these um, product services and so forth, but in order to meet the needs of communities rather than just meeting the needs of people in year four. So you'll see that there is a continuum slowly getting more and more complex and involved as students progress through primary school. Now around data, they start off looking at objects, pictures and symbols representing various elements of data, as we've seen in our lectures on curriculum and content. But then in year two, they learn how to process that data in different ways, how to make use of that data. Then in, by the end of year four, they need to use the same set of data for different purposes. And then by year six, they need to be using digital systems to represent that data, using um, digital spreadsheets and other systems to explore that data. So again, a progression of development over the year bands. Um, around algorithms, they start off by the end of year two, being able to sequence various um, activities and also introduce the concept of branching, being able to make choices. And they're doing so for a known user. So they have to identify solving a problem for someone. Now, that doesn't mean we can't do B-bots and some robotic activities in prep, but we're not formally having to assess them until the end of year two. Now, certainly you'll do some formative assessment, but in terms of formal reporting and expectations of what students have to be able to show that they can do at the end of a particular band, um, that's not required until the end of year two. By the end of year four, they'll be doing simple algorithms. So not just basic algorithms, now simple algorithms. And we're introducing the capacity to use iterations. So repeating loops. And then by year six, they're doing complex branching and iteration um, algorithms. And they're using variables. So we can see how we need to introduce new concepts as we progress along the bands. It's not to say you can't do things in earlier bands, but they don't have to have done them by those earlier bands. In terms of creating, communicating and choosing um, design ideas, they do that in prep. So it's important that students actually create something and then communicate their ideas and also choose their ideas, not just following what the teacher has as an idea or at least choosing between a number of teacher of generated ideas. Now, by the end of year two, they have to have addressed two of the prescribed contexts, particularly for design and technology, um, and identify the features and uses of technologies to create a design solution. By the end of year four, they need to be able to describe those features. So end of year two, they just need to identify the features by the end of year four, they need to have enough understanding of these features to be able to describe them. And by the end of year six, they need to be explaining how these features impact upon their designs. So how does the feature of, say, um, say different sheets of paper affect their paper plane designs? Now, in year two, they might just be able to identify that, yes, there is different types of paper. By the end of year four, they needed to be able to describe that those different types of paper, so some are heavier, some are lighter, some are stronger. But by the end of year six, they need to be able to describe why those pieces of paper actually affect the performance of them paper planes. And that applies to a whole range of different aspects around technologies. In prep, students will be making design solutions for a school selected context. So essentially a teacher selected context. 
Uh, but by the end of year two, students will be selecting their design ideas based upon their own personal preferences. So they get to choose the design. That's the big aspect. Students designing, not just following instructions. By the end of year four, they need to be doing so against criteria. So establishing the criteria of what their solution, what a solution has to be able to achieve. So let's say an egg drop, which we'll be doing this week. Um, it has to be able to survive falling from three meters. That is a criteria. Um, with their solutions being made up of these materials, that's another criteria. Um, so we set down these criteria and the student solutions have to meet those criteria. And then by the end of year six, students need to be able to justify why they chose various design aspects um, and justify their solutions based upon those criteria. So it's more explaining the purposes of why they did different things. Why did they use plastic bubble wrap around their eggs um, and so forth? Now, in terms of um, digital tools, by the end of year two, they need to have been using some common digital tools. So maybe um, looking at web pages, using a word processing tool, things of that nature. Then by the end of year four, they need to understand that these tools and computers and devices form systems. And that there's a range of what are called peripherals that we can attach to and expand these systems for different purposes. And that they can have a range of purposes that they're not just designed to do one single thing. Let's say a calculator designed for um, adding, multiplying, dividing, and subtracting. Um, we can have computers also being able to play games and do word processing, but also adding, multiplying, subtracting, and dividing. And then by the end of year six, they need to be able to use multiple systems. So not just one tool, one system, but multiple systems and how these systems can work together, particularly around uh, transmitting data or being part of networks and using them to communicate with others, but also the various components that make up these systems. So they're learning about how computers are made up of lots of different elements. Around communicating and collaborating, they start having to be able to do that formally by the end of year two and use models and drawings to assist in that communication and collaboration. By the end of year four, they need to be annotating and using symbols on their models and drawings to better explain what's happening. By the end of year six, this communication has to be to an audience. So it's not just to their teacher or to their, for their, for their own purposes, for their designs. They need to be able to explain it to others. Um, they need to be using technical terms and they need to be using graphical representation techniques. So more formalized ways of um, drawing and explaining. So using plan views and front views and, and things of that nature. And also using digital tools for these purposes. Um, there's various graphical drawing tools and, and so forth. In prep, they need to be shown that they can follow steps. So not the formal aspects of an algorithm, but they still need to be able to show that um, they can follow various steps. Might be steps for tying their shoelaces or steps for um, planting a seed in a garden. There are various steps that they need to be able to show. But by the end of year four, they need to be able to plan out a sequence of steps. So we've looked at, it, that, at that in algorithms, but we need to formally assess them at the end of year, by the end of year four on their ability to plan and sequence a series of steps. In terms of using materials and equipment, they start being assessed on that by, by in prep um, and how to safely use scissors and, and various other tools and hammers and things of that nature. Um, but by the end of year two, they need to be able to be able to produce things. So up until year end of year two, they're just using tools. But by the end of year two, they have to be able to use these tools for a specific purpose to achieve something. Um, the end of year four, they're using a range of technologies and techniques to do so. And of course, throughout all of this, they're doing it safely. And 
by the end of year six, students are making explicit choices around what technologies and tools they're going to use. So you have to allow and design your activities to allow a choice. So an example for the egg drop this week, you've got a choice of a range of materials. You wouldn't use all of the materials that you've been given. So you're going to need to make choices around which materials you're going to incorporate into your solutions. If you're only given specific um, material, let's say for the ice cream challenge, you were given the specific um, materials to make the ice cream and a specific um, topping. So every student would make the same and all of the ice creams would come out, hopefully, um, exactly the same. Now, that's useful in some contexts, but it doesn't really incorporate the design aspect of design and technologies. So students have to be able to be given choices to make design decisions, certainly by the end of year six, but I'd say a lot earlier than that as well in terms of in practice. Okay, last few in terms of the subject um, standards. Students need to be able to use basic features of common digital tools to create, locate, and share content. Um, that advances to the core features. And they also need to be able to then plan using these tools. Um, they also need to use the tools to collaborate and to follow agreed behaviors. So to make up agree, um, processes that all the students agree to, to follow. By the end of year six, they're using these tools for their project planning and the production processes particularly when they want to make a production line, when they're going to, say, make 100 um, ice cream cones. And in that case, they do want them all to be the same to their designs, but they want to have a production process that assures um, consistency and efficiency in the production um, elements that they're going to pro progress through. And they need to be able to identify examples of data and data that is owned by them. So what is their data? That's the concept we're trying to get across in prep. By the end of year two, they need to be able to recognize that digital tools can store data um, online and that, that data can be their personal data being stored online. By the end of year four, they need to be identify some of the risks around that. And by the end of year six, they need to have an understanding that they have a digital footprint and that that digital footprint can have permanence, that things stored online will be there potentially for their entire lives. Um, and so they need to take obviously care around what is then stored online and some personal responsibility for that. Okay, so that's the overall standards for the learning area. And then we have specific standards for each of the subjects. Now, some of this is a bit repetitious to the overall standards, but you do need to look at both when you're planning your assessment activities in particular. So again, they need to be able to identify familiar um, products and services and describe them. That one pretty much mirrors what occurs in the overall standard. Um, likewise, for their design solutions, um, starts off with a school selected context, the features, and they create um, uh, from the two of the contexts, and then by end of year six, th all three of the contexts, and about how their designs impact upon, or their, their choice of, of um, tools and techniques impacts upon the overall design that they are able to achieve. Um, again, many of these, are similar, but they start off with coming up with a design idea and having models and drawings by the end of year two, annotating with symbols in, in year four, and using graphical techniques and technical terms by year six. Likewise, following steps in prep with a sequence of steps in year two, planning those sequence of steps in year four, and developing project plans and production processes by the end of year six. achieving um, using digital systems, so we're now in digital systems, uh, using them for a purpose in prep, showing how they meet the needs of known users by the end of year two, um, having criteria brought into meeting those user needs 
by the year four and having what's called user stories and design criteria by the end of year six. So this becomes a little bit more detailed around meeting user needs, where we actually identify particular users and create stories around how they're going to use um, various technologies or various aspects of the solution that students are going to come up with. Um, we've already seen how they need to transition from objects, pictures and symbols to using them in different ways for different purposes and using digital systems to represent data. And then there's that aspect of algorithms again, starting off with sequences of steps and branching, then introducing iteration in year four, and then complex branching and iteration and use of variables by the end of year six. Um, again, around accessing digital systems for a purpose in year two, for a range of purposes by the end of year four, and um, how we have multiple systems working together by the end of year six. Um, using basic features by the end of year two, core features by the end of year four, and selecting um, the features or the tools that they're going to use based upon their features by the end of year six. But we also incorporate ideas of agreed behaviors, progressing through to agreed conventions. Um, so behaviors are um, being kind to one another, not, not hurting one another, things of that nature, through to formalized conventions. Um, you won't copy other people's works. Um, you won't break the copyright rules that exist, um, things of that nature. And again, looking at that idea of data that is owned by them, um, having personal data, having risk associated with sharing that personal data and the permanence of digital footprints. So these are the um, assessment standards that you need to ensure that students achieve when you're teaching various year levels. Now, unless you become a specialist technologies teacher, you won't necessarily be teaching across all of these year levels at once, but some of you may go on to become specialist technologies teachers. And we'll talk about that um, next week. But generally you'll be assigned a particular year level and you'll ensure that firstly, your students come into your class with the capacities of the previous band, what they should have achieved um, before coming to your year level. And your responsibility then is to bring them up to speed when they're deficient in various aspects. And of course, have them achieve what the expectations are by the end of your year level. So that then progress on to the next year band with the capacities um, that they are expected to have achieved. Now, if you're, say, teaching uh, midway through a year band, say teaching year three, then you need to negotiate with the year four teachers, and you'll do that in a collaborative way. All the year three teachers will work with the year four teachers, and we'll, you'll sit down and decide what aspects have to be achieved during year three, and what aspects will be achieved in year four. You don't have to achieve the entirety of a band, you work together to work out what's going to be achieved. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail um, in our next session. Okay, so some examples. These are called work samples, and you'll find them in the on the Australian Curriculum website. Now, at the moment, they're only available for the um, 8.4 version of the Australian Curriculum. And they're still being developed for version 9. But the 8.4 ones give us a good idea of the sorts of activities and how they can be assessed. Now, each of the work samples um, are provided with examples of um, students' um, work below expected standards, at the expected standard, and above the expected standard. Now, most of the ones I'm going to show you are at the exceeds or above standard um, responses. So in this case, students are learning about um, where food comes from and how it progresses from um, seeds to a sandwich. So how we can grow food and then use it on our, in our diet, in, on our sandwiches. So students work through various worksheets and activities in the garden. They plan out their gardening. They, they try to show how um, 
seeds progress to their sandwich on a, on a flow diagram um, and various other activities that they show evidence of and evidence of their learning. Because that's what the purpose of these work samples are. They are assess assessment tasks or assessment evidence that are used to make judgments on how students are placed in terms of meeting the expectations of the content descriptors. So some other examples from F2 in design and technology. This is where students are making costumes. Um, they have various materials and they're designing various costumes. This, this child is making a, a fish costume. Um, so representing some sort of underwater creature with scales and fins and various other elements that they've incorporated into their design. In this one, the students are looking at push-pull toys. They're making a toy that they can pull along or push along, and they're designing it and coming up with its creation. Um, in this example, they're doing a blog of how to work safely, how to prepare food, how to work in the garden, how to um, use various tools, how to use the hot glue gun. And they come up with various evidence of students' understanding of these concepts. In years three and four, in this, in this example, they're making a pneumatic um, catapult. So using syringes to provide compressed air to have the catapult launch um, little ping pong balls or, and so forth. And they've gone through this as a design project that they've worked on, coming up with their designs and then their solutions and testing their solutions and a whole lot of other material that would have gone into providing evidence of how students have progressed on that particular learning task. In this one, they are creating different types of gutters and looking at the efficiency of transferring water down a, a guttering system and down pipes to stop it from overflowing onto the roof. Um, and they explored different ideas and purposes and processes and tested them and came up with their gutter designs. In years five and six, in this case, they're making um, puppets that work off various motions and also creating circuits to power motors that move these puppets and have them move their arms and, and so forth. So again, coming up with all their design processes and then their solutions and evaluations and all the rest. There's more detail than just what's shown on this slide. Uh, if you go into the um, work samples, you'll see the body of evidence that's been collected around them and the annotations that have been made on, of, on each of these showing where um, the content descriptors have been achieved in various aspects of the evidence that's been provided. And in this case, um, they're designing a school garden and creating healthy meals from the produce from the garden. Again, going through a whole series of steps. Um, part of this was a slideshow presentation that the student presented on how they designed and used their garden and some worksheets and evidence of their making the food um, from the garden. In digital technologies, in F2, they're doing a beadbots activity and the teacher videoed the students explaining what the video, what the beadbots were going to do as part of their evidence collection. And the teacher went around taking photos of what the students were doing. Students were filling in various worksheets um, and so forth, collecting evidence of how students are meeting the content descriptors and the achievement um, standards that are required um, to show evidence of their learning. Um, in this case, the student is creating a digital system, um, fairly simple digital system, attaching a camera to their helmet so they can move around and take videos um, of various locations and objects. Not all of these are fantastic activities, um, but they do provide some evidence against the criteria that you need to look at in terms of the assessment standards. 
in this case, a common um, data collection activity, analysis activity, looking at school rubbish and going around and measuring where rubbish is in the school, what sort of rubbish is being deposited in various locations and representing that in various ways on maps, on graphs, on data tables, on infographics um, and so forth. And this example in years three and four, um, students are creating a robot car. Um, so, and they're programming it to move along. So they're using the theme around Rapunzel and um, getting Rapunzel out of her tower and creating various mechanical devices, which crosses over in design and technology. But because they're programming and that's the focus of the assessment, um, in terms of what the evidence is that they're showing that they have achieved. Um, that's why it's in digital technologies. But it could certainly be incorporated into a design of technology activity as well, or addressing both in the one activity. And in this example, um, they're creating a, a tutorial game to teach um, modification I think it's the main aspect, yeah, modification and division was this particular um, task. So there's various activities. They actually used, I think it was PowerPoint to create the actual game, although they may have used other tools, um, but it incorporated little video clips explaining how to do the modifications and various choices that students could make. So it was differentiation. So you can use quite simple tools um, to create uh, algorithms program solutions it doesn't have to be programming languages but it could also have been done just as easily in scratch or any of the other programming tools that students have got access to okay and the final example we're going to go through in a bit more detail and this was a scratch game in years five and six so students the work examples start off with a summary of the task so in this case the students had to design a game for another student, so for a buddy, so they had a, a, a purpose um, and they had to, um, they selected from three options and defined the problem that they were going to then um, solve. And then they designed and implemented their digital solution and recorded their developmental process. So these are the things that you would then link back to the achievement standards. Um, so in terms of looking at the achievement standards, by the end of year six, students need to be able to, um, in particular, create design solutions and design an algorithm involving complex branching and iteration and implement these in a visual programming language, including the use of variables, selecting and justifying their design ideas uh, and developing a solution against design criteria uh, for an audience and using technical terms and graphical representation techniques. So highlighted there are the um, assessment elements that are being addressed in the task, but you'll see that there are assessment ele or elements that weren't addressed. Um, they didn't really look at data. They didn't really look at digital systems. They didn't look at communicating. Um, no, they did, did most or did, wasn't involved in sharing um, their ideas with others. So there were not every assessment um, task or activity has to address all of the assessment elements. So that's from the learning area. And then um, from the, uh, and also from the learning area was developing project plans. But they didn't do anything around digital footprints or uh, even safety producing design solutions. So lots of aspects weren't addressed by this particular um, activity. In terms of the subject achievement standards, for digital technologies. Again, now they were developing and modifying a digital solution for a defined problem, or well, they defined the problem, um, they evaluated their solution. They, they did incorporate a little bit of representation of data. Um, they designed an algorithm and they used complex branching and iteration and variables. So this is the above satisfactory um, solution. And again, if you go to the work samples, you'll see it in more detail. Uh, but they had some worksheets where they designed out their solution and just 
and drew their designs and also um, planned out their evaluation. And then they had various screenshots and video recordings of their um, solution in practice. This was a satisfactory um, solution. And you'll see that it's not as complex. The programming code isn't as complex. The design isn't as complex. Their evaluation isn't as complex, but it still met the standards. So it wasn't exceptional, but it was still meeting the standards expected for a student at the end of year six. It is also an example of an unsatisfactory one. In this case, it didn't meet the standards. It didn't include any real complexity in the programming. It didn't include branching. It didn't include iteration. Um, it didn't include the use of variables. Their design was quite superficial. So it did have still some aspects in their design, but it was by no means, um, but it, a good point is that it, it would have still have met some of the assessment standards, but not sufficient for the overall task to be considered at a satisfactory standard. And this is a game where we make on balance judgments. So take a break, have a look at some of the work samples and consider what we've just been talking about and see if you can um, identify in the work samples what you would consider um, satisfactory or unsatisfactory um, in terms of what students have produced. Some of them can be a little bit tricky. This is what you'll need to be doing as a teacher quite a lot, making judgments on students' work. You do get quite proficient at it quite quickly. So it, at the start, it does seem difficult. But over time, you'll be doing lots of this and you'll become quite proficient at identifying whether or not students are meeting expectations or not. Um, and much of it will become automatic, which in itself becomes problematic. Of course, remember, you have to collect evidence of this so that you can explain it to others, particularly to parents. Um, and when things become automatic for you, sometimes you forget that you need to capture data to help explain it to others. OK, so have a look at those work samples and then we'll come back and explore the next aspect. OK, so hopefully you've seen some good examples of the process involved in making judgments on students' work to identify whether or not they're at above satisfactory or below satisfactory achievement standards. Now, one way we do this in a slightly more formalized approach is by the use of design briefs. They're essentially activities, but they're more formalized. Um, they have a scope, an audience and criteria, which sets down what students are expected to achieve. Um, we often use design briefs in competitions, which set out what students have to um, do in the competition and how they'll be judged against other students' um, results, other students' solutions in a competition format. Um, but we can also use them in everyday assessment um, activities. But it, um, in more formal processes, they're used generally to explain to clients, to others, what we could achieve in terms of our design solutions. And certainly in up in um, high school, students will use design briefs a lot more for that purpose. It can still be done in years five and six, um, where we do need to explain to an audience what our design solutions are and so forth, and maybe give our clients some choices. Let's say we're designing a system for the tuck shop, um, say some different lunches, and we want to present our ideas to the tuck shop staff and have them choose from the range of different um, potential lunches, uh, which to incorporate into the tuck shop menu. Um, so there can be lots of great activities where students use design briefs with clients, even down into the very earliest years. But in the main, it's not a requirement of the curriculum that they do so. 
So design briefs can vary in how they're used and so forth, but generally they provide a summary of what's going to be tried to be achieved. They identify the users, who, who they're actually making the solution for. They set out the requirements. We often call this the criteria um, about all the specifications of what the solution needs to be able to achieve. They present a proposed solution or sometimes a range of solutions. And they also identify what the resources are available and what the time frame is available. Now, many of the activities you've been doing in this course are really sort of described as little mini design briefs, as is the activities you're describing as part of your um, portfolio of learning activities. Um, they're really mini design briefs, but activity descriptions and design briefs are, have some strong similarities. One of the key aspects of design brief though is that they're quite concise and they're in bullet point form. They don't go into huge detail. Um, they still allow students to have choices and processes involved in designing the solutions. But they do help students clarify their design thinking. They help them set out what they want to achieve, how they're going to achieve it, what the resources and the time constraints they have, who they're achieving it for. So it helps clarify in their mind the task that they're trying to achieve. Um, this is just one of our framework for doing design briefs. What is the problem? The current solutions that are available, um, what they are going to improve upon, and what negative aspects might occur. Remember, sometimes students need to think about sustainability issues. Um, what could be the impact of their solution? Now, the following sort of examples are from middle years, but they can be applied for younger audiences or some aspects of them applied. These are slightly more formalized design briefs. Um, in this case, the design brief was to, for a major supermarket has asked them to design a nutritious product suitable for a specialty range for families. Um, and it needs to be a ready to eat meal or ready to eat dessert. So that's sort of their design brief. And then they went away and analyzed what sort of foods existed, the nutritional aspects of these different foods, the ingredients and the possible products, the environmental issues, um, the marketing processes involved. So lots of things that they could explore around coming up with these um, nutritious foods. Then they went out and did some market surveying. Um, they questioned other students about what they would eat, um, what sort of packaging they would are attracted to um, a whole range of different things that they explored um, in surveying others to get some data to help inform them with their solution decisions. They did more existing product research. So in this case, they were looking at cheesecakes and they went out and looked at a whole range of different cheesecakes, um, how much they cost, what, what the ingredients were, how they were made in terms of their recipes, and they compared them and considered which ones that they were going to sort of focus on or which what, what, what they could learn from these different existing products. Then they looked at their specifications, how many servings, how long it had to last in terms of shelf life, um, what it had to look like in terms of aesthetics, the manufacturing process of how it was going to be produced, the packaging the cost in issues, the green issues in terms of could it be recycled, um, the size and shape, the weight, the labeling, target groups, a whole range of different issues that they need to consider around specifying what their solution had to, was aiming to achieve. And this would then be used later in their evaluation against whether or not they actually achieved their solutions. Then they went through various initial ideas, um, looking at whether or not they were going to make lasagna or pizza or a sponge cake or a cheesecake. And they compared the various advantages and disadvantages of those. Then they decided on a trial to make some um, chocolate cakes um, and they worked out how much they were going to cost and they evaluated them in terms of their tastes and um, various other elements. Um, then they came down to looking at making um, cheesecakes 
and various developmental stages and approaches, like how long to cook it for, when to add different ingredients. And then they compared them, looking at their appearance and taste and texture and gave them various scores. Um, one group went and looked at pizzas and looked at specifying what would have to go on the pizza and so forth. Um, then they had their final product evaluations. So again, looking at their uh, products, how it actually then met various criteria, um, whether or not it was fruity, healthy, runny, set, colorful, light, fresh, um, and so forth. So there were a range of different criteria that they measured their solutions against. Then they documented their production process of how they made their cheesecakes. Um, they provided evidence in terms of graphical representations of that process in some flowcharts. And then they described their final products. Um, for this student, it was a um, it was a lasagna and showed the nutritional aspects of their final solution. Um, this was their photo diary in a document well, a template format where they showed photographs. The teacher gave them this uh, template and the students had to put in a photo of each of the stages during the production of their solutions. And that's an example of it filled in. Then they did some evaluation and testing. And again, they used flowcharts to help explain that process. Um, and then this was the quality assurance and quality control, uh, making sure that each of their solutions came out relatively similar so that um, as they made them, they would have some assurance that if they went into production, that um, they would all turn out relatively good. And then some final testing against criteria. So looking at, again, the specifications that they set at the start um, and then how well it met those specifications. So the function wasn't particularly up to scratch, um, but many of the others met their specifications quite well. And again, they talked about this in more detail, about how um, when they evaluated it, how it met their specifications or didn't meet their specifications. Okay, so that's a pretty detailed example of a design brief and all the different aspects that you could incorporate into a more complex tasks. So next we're going to look at the general capabilities. So meeting the assessment standards is one aspect of things you need to ensure that students achieve, but there are other elements incorporating the general capabilities and the thinking skills that we also want to make sure that students achieve in their studies. And in this case, we're going to explore in a little bit more detail the general capabilities and how we can assess those. So have a look at this little video clip about the general capabilities. Okay, so that was a little bit of an introduction to the general capabilities. Assessing them can be a little bit of a challenge because they're not formally specified within the curriculum in terms of what aspects need to be assessed when. What you do is you assess them as you do other um, content descriptors. So overall, um, the general capabilities look at understanding development, how students develop an understanding of these various skills and capabilities and ideas. Um, you monitor their growth around these capabilities and you ensure that there's certain alignment with the curriculum and assessment and approaches to your teaching. So how they, how you address those general capabilities. Um, students should get better in their understanding of the general capabilities and the skills involved in those. And they often do various projects um, and problems and conceptual skill developments that help them um, with the development of these capabilities overall. Now, I've provided you with more details about this approach 
in the um, extension readings if you want to go into more understanding about um, general capabilities and assessing them um, in terms of the theoretical frameworks that support that. But in practice, you need to be focused on the Australian curriculum general capabilities. And there are two groups of these. One is those that support students to be successful learners. And this includes their literacy and numeracy development, their digital literacy, and their critical and creative thinking um, skill development. And then there's a set that develop their ways of being, behaving, and learning to live with others. Um, these includes personal and social capability, ethical behavior, and intercultural understandings. And each of these is organized around six levels. Um, the first four are addressed in primary school. So you'll have them and they describe what needs to be achieved at the end of each year band. So um, they are fairly general. And unfortunately at the moment, they're still written for the um, curriculum version 8.4. Uh, but there'll be new ones developed for um, version 9, hopefully soon. So we're not going to go into too much detail in terms of unpacking them, but you just need to be aware that there are specifications about what students need to be able to achieve at each of the year bands. And they describe um, to some detail how they can be incorporated into the other assessment um, standards and content descriptors. Of course, that's how they're taught. We don't generally go and teach the general capabilities on their own. You don't have a lesson on doing um, digital uh, literacy. You develop digital literacy as you do other learning activities, not just in dig digital technologies, but also design and technology and in other subjects. That's the idea of the general capabilities. They're addressed in all learning areas, um, but they do still need to be specifically addressed. Now, the documentation does provide some guidance into where they're expected to be addressed in various subjects. So not all subjects have to address, say, literacy. Technologies doesn't do an awful lot of work around developing elements of literacy, but it does do a whole lot of work around developing aspects of um, digital literacy. So that aspect is spread across the curriculum. But you should always be looking for opportunities to incorporate general capability development. Now this should ideally be planned as a whole school exercise um, and identifying where everything's going to be done. Um, and that is often um, explored, uh, but sometimes that's not well done. Um, so teachers are encouraged to model the capabilities. So you should be mod modeling digital literacy whenever you have a chance. Likewise, you should be modeling numeracy and um, all the other elements. So modeling is a big part of being a teacher. But identifying where these connections are between subjects, and also it gives an opportunity to do some cross-curricular work when you're exploring an aspect of general capability um, and you're doing it, say, in digital technologies. You could also talk about how this aspect is also done in that work we did on studying the book we were doing in, in English. Um, or something we're doing in science. So there is op lots of opportunities to show interconnectivity. Um, again, you should provide a variety of learning activities, opportunities for students to practice these um, general capabilities in authentic ways, particularly when we're doing projects and other activities within the um, learning areas and the subjects, um, provide them with opportunities to actually put into practice what they're developing in terms of their general capabilities. And you need to provide them with feedback. Now, this is a challenge because they're not formally assessed, but students still need feedback in how they're progressing. Now, in Victoria, they do formally assess general capabilities and they've incorporated them into the curriculum and the content descriptors. In Queensland and the rest of Australia, we haven't um, integrated the general capabilities to that level. So it's left to teachers to formally uh, monitor students' progression around the general capabilities and to provide feedback to students and to parents on how that's occurring. So the Queensland Curriculum and Assessment Authority 
does provide a framework around the general capabilities and it provides some detail in what's expected in each of the bands. Um, and you can provide, you can see that in the, um, on the course website. So you can use this to help plan out whole school um, general capability development processes, but also look at what would be expected in your year level. But the key thing is just to keep these in mind and to keep constantly looking for opportunities to um, develop these capabilities um, when you're planning out other learning activities. Um, there is some guidance around how to do them both at the same time. In this case is particular around the digital literacy um, and the digital technologies subject. So just a few examples of where you can do both. Again, this is for version 8.4, but you can see how there are opportunities to do each when you're doing various assessment and um, learning activities. So in this case, doing some um, data collection and analysis, and there's opportunities to develop both the general capabilities and assessment of digital technologies. And again, lots of these opportunities exist. In this case, doing a little scratch game, again, where those opportunities exist in both circumstances and how you can incorporate various elements. And also, in particular, now that there's a strong focus on um, uh, digital safety in both the general capabilities and the digital technologies curriculum, there's opportunities to explore both when you address elements around that. But don't think you can just do digital literacy in digital technologies. You can also do it when you're doing a design and technology task or an English task or a mathematics task and so forth. And likewise with the other general capabilities. And just another aspect of that. Okay, so now we're going to look again at some other aspects of assessment and to get you in a frame of thinking around this, have a look at Sir Ken Robinson's perspective on assessment and why we do assessment. So have a look at that and then we'll come back and explore our next section. Okay, so hopefully that's given you some food for thought around the idea of assessment and why we do assessment and some of the traps we can fall into when we focus too much on assessment. Um, of course, we need to remember that the purpose of assessment, certainly for teachers, is to assist students learning. Learning is not there to assist assessment. Um, certainly it seems like that when you get into the upper levels of high school and, and so forth and indeed at university. But for the rest of K to, K to 10 at least, and certainly in primary school, assessment should always be subservient to learning. We assess in order to assist learning. It's not an aim in and of itself. Sometimes we get caught up with that, particularly when we have national assessments that judge schools against schools. And indeed, sometimes we have assessment that can be used for judging teachers. That aside, the main focus of assessment should always be supporting students learning. Now that said, there are different ways of assessing, different purposes of assessment at different levels. The big one is ongoing formative assessment. This should be the assessment that you're continuously doing in order to monitor students learning and to provide feedback to students. Um, but also feedback to yourself on how students are progressing. And this should be done continuously using a whole range of techniques. We're going to explore some of those. But there are other forms of assessment. And the other main one is summative assessment. And this is assessing students' performance. So formative assessment is essentially there to help students learn and to practice what they've learned. It's done throughout their um, courses, it identifies gaps and improvements and it's done via a whole range of different techniques. Summative assessment is generally done at the end of a period. So you're providing evidence of students learning over a period of time. Um, it's used to collect evidence on students' knowledge, skills or proficiencies. 
and it's generally done as an exit point showing what they've achieved so that the next stage that they go to in their learning the next year band the next teacher going into high school they know what they've learned um, there are a range of different approaches for doing these just a couple of ideas around formative assessment using concept maps and diagrams checklists i think aloud processes where students explain what they're thinking and how they're going about doing a task ad hoc quizzes a whole range of different approaches you can use that's just four summative assessment a few of the more traditional approaches doing a test um, having students do a project and looking at their final results doing a presentation doing a text production where they're writing an essay or explaining something in more extended writing formats so much more formalized but the purpose of summative assessment is generally around twice yearly reporting to parents um, on students progress and their achievement against the various standards now there's also annual testing um, we have our literacy and numeracy tests that are done annually called the NAPLAN tests uh, and they're done for years three five seven and nine but we also have periodic national testing um, called the NAP program national assessment program and this is done of specific learning areas and one of these is ICT computing um, it's done every three years it's only done for selected schools it's only done with year six and year ten students but it is a national assessment process and it's done to monitor students understanding of digital technologies and how that understanding is improving or getting worse uh, as we progress over time so it's only done every three years so it's not it's a snapshot but it's been done four times now so we've got, got a good pretty pretty good understanding of how students understanding of digital literacy is going in Australia and it addresses a range of different aspects but it is one element that uh, you are specifically responsible in digital technologies education for ensuring that your students are well prepared for particularly for student uh, for teachers in year six um, of course schools are judged and compared against one another and more specifically principals are judged and compared against one another so your principal will be particularly interested in making sure that you have prepared your students um, to do well on the national assessment program just as they are particularly focused on ensuring that students do well every year on literacy and numeracy because it is done um, externally and schools and principals and indeed states and countries are judged and compared against one another using these tests and unfortunately that does drive various teaching and learning processes not always to the good but um, it is something we have to accommodate okay some other techniques though for formative assessment one of these is um, quite popular in schools at the moment around making learning visible so making students learning visible to you as their teacher and to the students themselves so one aspect of this is around asking and answering questions so one approach is no hands up this is you can't put your hand up to answer a question you can put your hand up to ask a question but not to answer a question so you'll still ask questions to the whole class but every student has to be ready to give an answer not just those that want to answer and the precocious uh, student in the front row that always puts their hand up to answer the, every question um, that's not allowed every student has to be ready to answer a question that the teacher poses and this changes their focus in that they all need to be ready to give an answer rather than just waiting for um, the know-it-all student to always answer I shouldn't say that I was one of those students uh, <laughs> so other approaches around this is using lollipop sticks um, with students names on and you pull it pull them out you know, patter pop sticks and you hold the name up and say um, Sally Smith what's the answer to this um, or there's online name pickers that you can use that randomly select a name and display it so there's a range of ways of making it fun and gamifying 
the process of selecting students to answer questions. But the key thing is it makes sure that every student listens to the question and thinks about an answer to that. Now, of course, some of them are going to get it wrong, but the idea is that they all have to be preparing a response and an answer. Another technique is asking what are called ungoogleable questions. Lots of questions we ask are simply simple fact-based questions, ones that students could have memorized or can quickly look up using Google or other search engines. But we should try to ask questions that show students' understanding rather than just their ability to memorize or repeat a response. Um, and in particular, asking what are called higher order thinking skill questions which force students to think about the question and their response to the question. So what might happen if this happened, if this occurs? How would, if this happens, affect this? In your opinion, is this better than this? These force students to think about things in more detail, not just respond with a set response. Now, you can also do this though in setting quizzes and exams. <laughs> Another variation on this, combining the first two, is what's called the pose, pause, pounce and bounce approach. In this case, we pose an ungoogable question. So a question that students need to think about. Um, then you randomly choose who's going to respond, but pouncing on a student. Then you what's called bounce that response to another student. Do they agree? Do they think that answer is right? Is there something that they left out? Or would they change something in that response? And you can then keep bouncing that around a whole range of students until you've explored that question um, sufficiently and you think that all the students have gained from that activity. So it's a way of improving our um, processes of asking questions and getting student responses so that you gain a much better idea of how a range of students are thinking about a particular concept, but also that the students gain a better idea of how different students are thinking around a particular question. Um, now, this has been compared to table tennis versus basketball. In table tennis, you just throw a question out there and the students respond back with their answer. Using the uh, pose, pause, pounce, bounce approach, it's more like basketball. You pose a question, you throw it out to your class, and then it moves around the class and it changes and evolves as the class engages with the question. So a much more nuanced and involved um, questioning approach. Another approach you can use around formative assessment is modeling great learning. So yes, we'll often model how to do something and essentially the correct answer, but in technologies, we often model it in how we like make a paper plane and we show students how we would make a paper plane. And students would then go and do similar um, responses on their own. But we can also co-construct what would make a good paper plane. So talking with your students, okay, what we're going to make this paper plane. This is how I'm folding it. What does it have to be able to do? If it has to be able to stay up in the air the longest, that's quite a different paper plane design. And you would then talk through with your students, okay, what needs to be done then? Okay, maybe we need to make the wings as large as possible. If it has to be able to go fast and far, then that's different. We might want to then make it as streamlined as possible and have quite small wings. So talking with your class, with your students, through what needs to be done and then modeling your thought processes with your students' thought processes in how to actually make a solution is much better than just you showing them and demonstrating some ideal solutions. So you work with them. Another approach is to make mistakes. Do something even purposely wrong. Um, it's also a great way of excusing your own mistakes, particularly spelling mistakes. So. Um, but it could be a mistake, say, in programming code, where you've done a flowchart, and then you purposely make a mistake in there so that it won't work. And you talk through students how it's going to work, and then they identify that mistake. 
And then you work through, okay, what needs to be then done to correct that mistake? Um, you do that judiciously, but it's certainly an effective way of helping students engage with their thought processes and for you to formatively assess students thinking and understanding much more in much more detail than just having them do a task. Um, another aspect of that is the thinking out loud process where certainly when you're modeling it, you think out loud and you explain what you're doing. Getting students in pairs and having them think out loud and explain what they're doing allows you to monitor that, but also students have to articulate their own thinking to explain it and that helps them understand their own thinking more. But also if they're explaining it to their, their um, colleague, their peer, their friends, they have to be able to understand what's being explained to them and that helps their thinking. So having students talking through and explaining what they're doing is a really important aspect. And you of course need to model that to them. And this helps you not just uh, address um, some of the um, general capabilities, which often are expressed in these processes around communication and collaboration and thinking processes, but also some of the more complex thinking skills around computational thinking and design thinking and systems thinking. Having students express their thinking is a really important aspect of their learning. And if they're just doing it on their own, working individually and completing tasks, that often doesn't occur. Um, other aspects around doing this is that explicitly doing it with students can celebrate achievements. So when you get it working, then we celebrate that. We celebrate your own achievement in having achieved it, but also the students in having helped you achieve that. Um, and it really helps make the process more enjoyable rather than seeing it as an individualized assessment oriented task it becomes a fun activity. Um, so doing it with your students can really help create that um, vibe, but also doing it just individually in small groups. When they achieve it as a group, there's an opportunity to celebrate that. Whereas if they achieve it on their own, it's much less of a celebratory process. And again, it puts that emphasis on developing these thinking skills and these mindsets. But some of those mindsets are around working well with others, um, helping others, not just doing it for your own benefit, but doing it for others' benefit. Um, these are all important aspects that we want to develop in students. Okay, another approach around formative assessment involves frequent reflection. So not just having reflection at the end of a project or at the end of a lesson, but doing it continuously, having students think, okay, has we have we done this well? Are we doing this well? Are we doing this poorly? Is there mistakes being made? Um, so encouraging frequent reflection is a really great way of learning and it also helps chunk the learning. So we, rather than having to learn everything at once and then sort of assessing and reflecting on it, doing it as we go in smaller bits is a much better way of um, developing understanding and mastering the process. We've tried in this course to model that process whereby you're doing lots and lots of little assessments and chunks of learning as you go, rather than doing big blocks of learning and then assessing it and seeing how you've learned and reflecting on it at that point. Um, a continuous process of learning and assessment and reflection tends to be more effective than um, assessment and reflection at the end of significant blocks of learning. Now, a few little approaches in this. The what went well question uh, should be asked continuously as you're going around with students. Okay, what went well with you putting, using the glue gun here and doing this, explaining how they join two bits together in their bridge building process. Now, certainly you're going to assess the whole bridge and the whole solution at some stage, but asking them how things are going with individual little bits is a really important part of reflecting on those aspects and improving how they're going. The other aspect, even better if. So what worked well doing this, but what could make it better? How could you have done that even better? And that can help them improve 
and go through the cycle of improvement in a much more efficient way, rather than again, looking at the end in terms of their solution and only think of, thinking about improvements once they've already completed the task. Another way of getting feedback, particularly when you're doing whole group instruction is hands up, eyes closed, traffic light poles, where you simply ask them, okay, who's understanding this idea of, um, let's say digital footprints. And they all put their heads down, close their eyes, and they hold up their hands and put up one, two or three fingers. Be careful which way the fingers are pointing. Um, and uh, one finger means they need help. Two finger means they understand it enough. And I use three fingers to show that they've really mastered and they really want to move on. Um, so there's ways of getting that immediate feedback. And by having it done anonymously, so the students aren't looking at how each other's are going, but only showing how they're going to you, then they can express the fact that they are needing assistance without um, having any negative connotations from their peers. Okay, so all of this comes back to this idea of making thinking visible, making what the students are thinking about and how they're going in their understanding of concepts visible to you as the teacher, but also visible to themselves, and sometimes also visible to their peers so that they can help each other with their learning and, and so forth. This helps you then address misconceptions, helps you celebrate their understanding, and also supports and stretches them so that when you've identified that they've achieved and are doing well, you can push them on and do more advanced stuff rather than them just having to master things over and over. But most importantly, it helps you identify where they're having troubles and making sure that they all achieve success. Another way of doing this is using mini whiteboards. Um, they're quite cheap. Um, you can get them at sort of $2 shops and so forth that allow students to then do quick drawings or comments or explanations and hold them up to you, to the teacher. And you can have the whole class holding them up and you can see fairly quickly how they're all progressing. Um, just a way of giving rapid feedback to teachers. And you can do that range around a whole range of things. Could just even be holding up the answers to a question, uh, but it's normally done through a diagram or through some sort of little mind map. Or, but it can be just to express their feelings. They could do a picture of how they're feeling or how they're feeling their design solution is going to progress and so forth. That it's an efficient way of getting feedback from a whole class at once. Whereas if you've got to go around and um, question each individual student, it's a much more laborious process and time consuming process. Um, thinking routines is another structure that helps you um, build in ways of um, getting feedback from your students. Um, so think pair shares is a very common task where the students, students um, think about a concept, they reflect on it on their own, then they pair up and they share what their understanding is of that concept and they compare what they thought about it. And this helps them build better understandings. And a key component to add to that is when they have dissonance, when they have different ideas around what was understood, that's when they go and ask the teacher um, which of their approaches, which of their ideas is the correct one. Um, if they've got agreement, then you generally go with that and just hope that they, they didn't get the wrong answer or a misunderstanding. Um, but it does help you build a, what's called the wisdom of the group. Um, again, it makes things more efficient for you as a teacher. You don't have time to go and work one on one with every student every instance. Um, there's not 25 or 30 of you. So you do need to work in ways of improving um, the value of what is being done around trying to understand what's occurring with your students. And your students are the great greatest resource for that. Yes, there are other now more technical ways. We've got AI systems and robotic systems where we can have those work individually with students. But we can't use those all the time. Another aspect building upon this is what's called learning conversations, 
where you have time to go and actually talk one-on-one -on -one to your students. So you can't do this obviously all the time, but having some time where you go around and actually ask students how they're going, what's happening, what are their thinking approaches, um, where they're having difficulties and try to personalize some activities. So based upon what you find out from your students, you then direct them to either extend or do reinforcement activities or extension activities or um, various other elements that you can have pre-planned. But the idea is to try to make it as personal as possible for your students. They want to get to know you as, you, as their teacher. They want to have that time and having some time alone, even if it's only a few seconds. Um, and the reality is we've done studies about how much time and generally students only ever get to have one or one or two minutes alone time with their teachers every week. Um, but that in itself is still very valuable. Now, in those conversations, you want to maximize the value of them, though. So take notes. Um, use that as a data collection time when you can actually find out how students are going and um, build a picture over time, particularly on, say, things that they're interested in. That's a big one I've always found, because when you set new activities, you want students to explore projects around topics that they're interested in. Um, and you want to provide resources and guidance around that interest. So you've got to find out what those interests are. Um, so I spent a fair bit of time in the early parts of a, of a year finding out what students' interests are. So are they interested in particular sports or games or movies? And just chop those down. Because it might be six months later, you, you're thinking about a project that they're going to work on. Say it's a data collection project. And you decide, okay, we've got a whole lot of students that are interested in Harry Potter. Let's make a, an assignment around that as a thing so that that will engage those students. But then we other students with other interests. So you need to want, make sure that... And the students really appreciate you incorporating their interests into things. Now, another way of building efficiency, though, around... Um, answering students' questions in particular, is the C3 B, B4 ME approach. So essentially what this means is that students are expected to have looked for an answer to a question in at least three sources. Now, it may be other students, it may be online, it may be um, a mentor process or a teacher assistant, but they need to have gone to at least three other sources of potential solutions to a question before they come to you as the teacher to give them the answer to the question. Now, of course, they won't always do this, but it's an ideal and certainly it allows you to uh, maximize your time to address more complex needs rather than answering relatively trivial questions. And it also builds students' responsibility um, that they should be able to answer simple questions without just relying upon their teacher to repeat what you've just taught, told them five minutes ago in explaining instructions to a problem or a task or an activity. Another approach is peer critique. And particularly when we're looking at um, project solutions and how they met specifications and feedback and moving towards more formal assessment, um, have students assess each other. Now you have to teach them how to do this though, because they're not going to be practiced at doing this, at least initially, unless you've had some great teachers beforehand. Um, so there needs to be some agreed protocols around providing this feedback and what we call feed forward. Um, so there are two particular protocols that should be used to encourage students when we're using peer critique processes or peer feedback processes. The first is that we're hard on the content. So we're tough because we want to make sure that they do better. We want to make sure that the person we're giving feedback to is going to improve. So what they need to be hard on terms of what they've done in terms of the product that they've achieved. So if it hasn't been good at um, feeding the chickens, we need to be tough and say that. It's not really good at feeding the chickens. The chickens are going to starve because it's not giving enough grain to them. A bit of an extreme example, but... Um, the plane could have gone flown further if you'd been better at folding the creases so that they were straighter. Um, so you're tough on the content. 
but you're soft on the people. So you appreciate that people are invested in what they've done. So it looks great as a plane. And obviously you put a lot of effort into making the plane. It's really sad that it didn't fly as far as it did. And um, so you you don't critique the person. You don't say that they were dumb or that they didn't put enough effort in, a whole lot of things around that. It's the product and the, what was produced. That's what the focus of the critique is. And it needs to be kind, but realistic. So we should never just be say something just to be mean. Uh, the fact that it didn't fly as far as yours is irrelevant if it still met the criteria. If it flew enough to achieve what was intended, that should be celebrated. Um, but we also have to be specific. We have to give advice that's helpful. How specifically could it have been done better? Uh, and this can be challenging for students, particularly if they're not totally sure about how things work themselves. But that's the aim of the feedback. It's not just to say whether or not they liked it or not. It's to say whether or not it was a good solution because of certain things that um, were done, or it was a bad solution because of certain things that weren't done or weren't um, able to be able to achieve in the solution. So we need to teach our students how to provide critique effectively um, and to practice it, to use those techniques. Okay. So let's look now at an example of um, critique and feedback and how students can do this and how you can teach students how to do this through an example of Austin's butterfly. Okay, so hopefully you've been able to see how we can use um, critique in a positive way to provide feedback and then really help students improve on their work over time. Now, in the tutorial this week, before the tutorial, I want you to think about how you're going to assess the egg drop activity you're going to do during the tutorial. So think at all about all the different assessment processes we've been looking at. Think about assessing it formally. Think about assessing it formatively. I should say summatively and formatively. Um, so what are the aspects you're going to assess? So what would you assess? Um, what techniques you, would you use to assess? And how would you make judgments? This is where as a teacher, the assessment process becomes challenging. How are you going to assess whether or not a student is above the standard expected, meeting the standard or below the standard? Because that's when it becomes important around your assessment criteria or the, the techniques you're using around your assessment. How are you going to make assessment or judgments on whether or not students are above meeting or below the standard that is expected. And then share that assessment approach onto Teams and onto Learning at Griffith. Then in the tutorial, you're going to do the age old egg drop challenge. So the idea is you're going to have a raw egg, does need to be raw, um, and you're going to create a solution that will allow that egg to be dropped at least three meters onto concrete. Now, if you don't have a three meter dropping point, you can launch your egg into the sky and then have it come down. But normally there's a space somewhere where you can go that you can um, drop something a reasonable height onto a reasonably hard surface. Now, to make it a little bit more challenging, you uh, can only use a certain set of materials. So the materials that you've got available or you can make available at home or reasonable um, variations on the materials is at least one egg. Um, in the tutorials, we're giving you two. So if one breaks, you can go back and quickly do another solution. We've also got some plasticine and plastic eggs. Um, the Kinder Surprise eggs are good for this, um, just so that you can fit them inside your construction and see how it all works. And so while you're building your solutions, you're not likely to break your eggs just in the construction process. Um, you can use some plastic bags, not too many. You can't just use a thousand plastic bags. So a reasonable number of bags, like 
three or four plastic bags. Um, and these can be used for making things such as airbags or parachutes or various other solutions to the problem. Um, you can use paddle pop sticks and spaghetti to make frameworks to um, encompass your egg. Uh, and you can use rubber bands to again support that process and glue guns to do so and, and also masking tape. But you can't go excessive. You can't just make a huge giant ball two meters wide of masking tape. Not that you've probably got that much masking tape about it, but within reason. Um, the idea of the masking tape and the rubber bands are more to hold things together. Um, the idea of the paddle pop sticks or the spaghetti strands are to provide some aspects of cushioning. And the idea of the um, plastic bags are to provide some aspects of um, parachuting or cushioning. But again, not super excessive. You can't just use 100, air, 100 plastic bags to make this giant balloon. Um, but the idea is to make some form of construction. Now, you can also use a small amount of string. Now, the reason I'm restricted to one meter is you can't make a system for lowering the um, the egg safely to the ground. Uh, that would be not in the spirit of the challenge. Uh, yes, with the plastic bags and the, and the string, it is possible to make something that um, will lower the egg, but that's not an egg drop challenge. That's an egg lowering challenge. So that's not acceptable. But within that, you can certainly use your imaginations and think about different ways of doing so. Uh, there are a number of videos in the course materials to assist you in coming up with some ideas, but don't be limited by them. And there's also hundreds of other videos uh, of egg drop challenges you'll find on YouTube. Um, but I look forward to seeing various solutions that you're able to achieve around the egg drop challenge. But the other aspect of this is to think about the assessment. How are you going to make judgments on whether or not it was a good solution? So think through your um, solutions and your tutors will assist you with this in the tutorials as to how it would be assessed. It's a relatively simple challenge. Think about though what it can actually tell you around the content descriptors and the accessible elements in the curriculum, but also potentially the general capabilities and the high water thinking skills. What can we use this challenge for in order to develop in students around various concepts, but also how we can then assess that development around various ideas and concepts. That's the big focus of the egg drop challenge this week. Okay, so that's it for this week and look forward to discussing with you the final session where we're going to wrap everything up and look at where you're able to go forward in terms of technologies education.